Hello and welcome to another in our series of lectures in world history. And uh, we're going to be continuing on with the lectures on China. So when we get down to the 3rd century BC, we see in the final decades of the Warring States period that it is the state of Qin that one by one takes on, defeats, and absorbs its enemies. <clears throat> this process reaches its conclusion in the year 221 BC, when the state of Qin defeats the last of the remaining states. Uh, the state of Chu, a large state in the, the south of China. And they're defeated in uh, 221 BC. The leader of the Qin at this time is a very famous king. We call him Qin Shi Huangdi. Qin is the state of Qin. Shi is a word that means the beginning or the first. And Huangdi is a word which now enters into the Chinese vocabulary in this meaning for the first time. <clears throat> and it means emperor. So Qin Shi Huangdi is the fellow that we identify as the first emperor of the Qin. The adoption of the term Huangdi to mean emperor is a very significant act. Up until this time, the leader, the ruler, the head of a dynasty, was called the king. The term in Chinese is Wong. Huangdi was a very ancient mythological figure back in the age of Yao and Shun. Not necessarily even a fully human figure, sort of spiritual being who guided uh, certain of the affairs of mankind. For the king of Qin to, in 221, now adopt the title of Huangdi, was a claim to a kind of rulership that had not been seen in China previously. It was a claim to total power over all of China. Now that the last of the other states had been eliminated, the entire territory of China was under a single rule. Qin Shi Huangdi proclaimed himself essentially to be the lord of all. And that's a, it's a pretty grandiose claim. It's ironic, too, because as history plays out, the Qin dynasty only lasts about 14 years. It lasts from 221 to about 207 BC. In that time, and in particular in the early years after unification, the Qin undertake dramatic transformations. It established a single state, controlling vast territory from the mountains in the north, all the way down into almost the tropics, almost into what is today Vietnam. It's a very extensive territory larger than the Zhou state had been at its height. Within China, Qin Shi Huangdi sets about to create a single administrative system, and he pursues a number of policies and a number of campaigns, which are very significant because they create the condition for an integrated empire to persist even after the Qin dynasty itself collapses. In the first place, this has to do with what we might call standardization. Uh, when China had been divided during those many centuries of division, the spring and autumn period, the warring states period, when the Zhou order broke down and as many as 250 different states were scattered all over China, local circumstances had diverged quite a bit. Early in the Zhou, with a single royal system, China had been fairly coherent. But during those long centuries of fragmentation, different parts of the country had gone their own way. For example, wagons and carts had axles of different lengths, 
in one state, in the state of Lu, your axle might be one length, and the wheels, when you run the carts down the road, of course, the wheels would carve ruts in the dirt roads. When you get to the border between the state of Lu and the state of Qi next door, the state of Qi might have carts with axles that were a different length, and so the ruts in the roads would be a different width. And so you'd have to, when you got to the border, take stuff out of one cart, put it in another cart, and go on your way. This was very effective for the warring states, for the different small states, because it meant that they could control trade across their borders. It was, in fact, uh, desirable in some ways from the point of view of these many different rulers. When you're presiding over a unified empire and you want an integrated system of commerce all over the territory, it's a bad thing. So Chen Shi Huangdi decrees a proper length for axles. Of course, it's the axle length of the state of Chen. So all carts, all wagons throughout China, have to now have the same width of axles. This makes, after a certain amount of time, for an integrated transportation and communication system. Coinage was another example. States had made their own coins, and they differed in shape. Some were shaped, uh, some that they called spade-shaped, and some were made like little knife blades. Some were just lumps of copper. In the Chen states, the coins were round with a square hole in the middle so that they could be strung on a string or a rawhide, and the Chen coins were made the standard for the whole empire. Writing, the Chinese writing system. Individual states had developed their own particular techniques for producing the written characters. The characters were essentially the same, but they were written a little bit differently. The style of the strokes composing the character, a little bit different. Now, the characters of the state of Chen are prescribed as the national norm. So standardization to be imposed from the center as a way of bringing the whole system into consistency. It was not simply a matter of material things, carts, coins, and writing. It was also important from the Chen point of view to establish a standardized ideological system. The Chen were not particularly enamored of the ideas of Confucius or Lao Tzu or any of the other schools of a hundred thoughts. For Chen Shi Huangdi, it was his ideas that counted. It was the doctrines of legalism that counted. This led in the year 214 to one of the great traumatic events in Chinese history, which was the burning of books and the burning of scholars. Basically, only books that were either teachings of legalism or practical texts, books about how to build agricultural equipment, certain mathematical texts, books that were of purely practical utility, were books that reflected the teachings of legalism. Those were allowed. All other books were banished. Banished meaning if you owned a copy, you needed to turn it in. You needed to take it to your local government official, turn it in, and then they were all assembled and burned. Thousands and thousands of copies of books were burned. Of course, this is at a time when it's before the invention of printing in China. It's time when books were hand-copied, and the destruction of these manuscripts was very thorough. The penalties were severe. If you're caught with an illegal book, not only was the book burned, but you were also burned. So it was a system that meant to eradicate ideas other than those which were officially authorized by the Chen. Given that it was a time before printing books, 
written texts were only part of the way in it in which <clears throat> knowledge was transmitted. Perhaps even more significant was the oral teaching, the verbal teaching by scholars of their students. And so to ensure that these doctrines were eradicated, Xin Shi Huangdi ordered that the scholars, the teachers who knew these texts by heart, would be rounded up and they were buried alive. So very severe efforts to eliminate non-Orthodox ideas and teachings from the state, from society, were put into effect. And it was very effective. We have very few texts which date from before the fall of the Qin Dynasty. Most of the books that are older than this, which we have today, are versions that were written down after the fall of the Qin. There's a very active period once the Qin collapses and a new dynasty replaces it. There's a very intense period of trying to recover these texts. Of course, sometimes that results in alternate versions. One guy remembers it one way, another guy remembers it a different way. So alternate versions of text sometimes emerged. This trauma was so severe that it led to a renewal, ironically. I don't think this was what the Chen had in mind. But it led to a renewal of thinking about the problems of society and government in the next century. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. <clears throat> the Chen state, very powerful, very ruthless, very effective. The Chen system of legalism was a perfect mechanism for gaining power, but it proved not to be an effective mechanism for retaining power and for ruling, because although they imposed standardization, although they imposed ideological orthodoxy on the state, on the empire, there was no method of self-regulation. There was no moral restraint on the actions of the ruler. Chen Shi Huangdi pursued his power totally in his own self-interest. Eventually, the cruelty, the extractions that he exacted from his people led them to revolt. And in 207, his state was overthrown. Now, normally at this point, I also show a video on the life of Qin Shi Huangdi. You can find it on YouTube. Again, I'm not able to show that through these lectures because this is also on YouTube and YouTube could give it a copyright strike because I don't have authorization to show it and it could remove this video. So unfortunately, I can't do anything other than direct you to go and look it up. It's it's a fantastic uh, one. Just look up Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor of China, or just the first emperor of China, and you should be able to find it. It's uh, it's quite quite good. All right, so <clears throat> the Qin Dynasty collapses in 207. The first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi, who had presided over the unification of China, the conclusion of the Warring States period, the defeat of the state of Chu, the last of its rivals in 221, had lived until 210. After his death, his son took over as the second emperor, but proved unable to hold together the empire that his father had assembled. The harshness of Chen rule, the legalist doctrines of rewards and punishments, the view of the state as essentially the private property of the emperor proved to be a system that, while it was effective in gaining power, wasn't a good way to hold on to power. It wasn't a good way to rule the empire, and so rebellions began to break out. People rose up against the harshness, the cruelty of the Qin, and the second emperor was killed. The dynasty was overthrown. And then a period of about five years of civil war follows, where different contenders emerge 
trying to create a new order, trying to establish a new dynasty. <clears throat> Fairly quickly, two principal contenders emerged in the struggle to succeed the Chen. The first of these was a man called Shang Yu. Shang Yu was a general. He'd been a commander of the armies of the state of Chu prior to the unification in 221 BC. He's a very competent individual. If Las Vegas bookmakers had been around to bet on the outcome of the struggle to succeed the Chen, he'd probably have been their favorite. His principal opponent was a man named Liu Bang. Very few people would have put their money on Liu Bang, at least at the beginning of the process. Liu Bang was a relatively minor figure. He wasn't even a member of the official elite. He wasn't a she. He was a jailer. His job, under the Chen, and it was a minor position in a local administration, his job was to escort groups of prisoners from the local jail to the next highest level, the county jail, if you will. When things began to fall apart, just around the time that the Chen was collapsing, Liu Bang was embarked upon one of his missions, and it involved an overnight journey. In the night, he camped with some of these prisoners, but when he got up in the morning, he found that several of them had escaped. He knew that this meant he had failed to fulfill his duties, to perform his task, and that under the Chin system, he would be severely punished. He took what at that point seemed to be a viable alternate route. He assembled his remaining prisoners, told them he would set them free if they would follow him. And this became the core of his army. He then became a rebel, a fighter against the Chen. And after the collapse of the dynasty, he continued to mobilize forces to raise followers. And eventually he was able to rise up and become a serious military challenger for power. He was a very unlikely contender to begin with. Shang Yu and Liu Bang eventually came into direct conflict with one another. In the year 204 BC, there was a great battle in which Shang Yu defeated Liu Bang's forces, inflicted a very devastating defeat, and pretty much everyone thought that Liu Bang was done. But that proved not to be the case. He carried out a very clever strategic withdrawal, moved away from the center of the area of battle, off to a small river port on the upper Yellow River, where there was a granary. And he seized this granary and was able to feed his troops to uh, rec and use that grain to recruit new followers, pay their wages in grain. Two years later, it was Liu Bang who finally emerges as the victor, defeating Shang Yu in a very dramatic siege, where at the very end, Shang Yu realized that his situation was hopeless. Liu Bang had surrounded Shang Yu's encampment with soldiers from the former Chu army, who sang the folk songs of their native places, and when Shang Yu heard the songs of his homeland being sung by the troops surrounding his own camp, he knew that his cause was lost. He had a final evening with his favorite concubine, they drank wine together, and then he killed her, leaped on his horse and rode headlong into the enemy lines, where he was cut down. So it's a very dramatic, romantic ending to this conflict, and it leaves Liu Bang in control of the field of battle, in, therefore in control of the empire. Liu Bang proclaims then 
a new dynasty. And he calls this the Han Dynasty. Han was the name of the district that Yu Bang had come from. The Han Dynasty becomes one of the great ages in Chinese history. It lasts for over 400 years. It's contemporary with the Roman Empire in the West, and it's about as extensive. It's a large and expansive territorial empire that, in size and population and wealth, it really was a match for, if not indeed somewhat larger, than that of the Roman Empire. Liu Bang establishes his capital at Shan, which is the same place that the Zhou had their first capital, where the Chen had had their capital. Liu Bang calls it Chang'an, which means eternal tranquility, or eternal peace. It is today the city of Shan, for present-day references, if you want to take a look at it in a map. And from there, he establishes a system of imperial governance, which is in some ways a continuation of the administrative organization of the Chen, but which evolves over the first century of Han rule into a very different and much more stable and viable order. The system that Liu Bang sets about establishing, at least initially, has a great internal dichotomy, a great internal division. In the western half of the territories of the Han, there's a system of administration which is run directly from the imperial capital. The emperor appoints officials, they go out, they serve the local government. They serve at the pleasure of the emperor and they serve for relatively short, fixed terms of office, and then they're rotated around to different places. This allows the imperial court to maintain direct control of the operations of government throughout this part of the empire. But in the eastern half of the empire, power is given to military leaders who had been in Yu Bang's army and who had helped him to secure these territories, but who had pledged their loyalty to him. There's a certain element of familiarity about this, because in some ways it's similar to the situation that evolves in the Zhou dynasty, where you have a royal court, but farther away, in the more marginal areas of the state, you have rule being exercised by local strongmen who have connections to the king, but those weaken over time. There's the potential for that here in the early Han. Liu Bang and his successors control the western half of the empire directly, but the eastern half has been granted out as fiefs to these military leaders, and that indeed does become a problem. Nonetheless, Liu Bang has a successful foundation to his empire. He lives down into the 190s and passes on his throne to his son so that a stable succession takes place for the next few rulers. There are some challenges that emerge early in the 2nd century BC, the early Han state, but they manage to survive those. In the early 180s, for example, the family of the empress, the emperor's wife, Emperor Lu is her name. Her family seeks to develop influence at court. They seek to dominate the court, and they seek to control the succession of which of her sons will be the next emperor. In 180, when the next dynastic succession takes place, the next emperor comes to the throne. There's a great confrontation and the Liu family managed to prevent the Wu family from exercising too much power. They're pushed off. They're returned to a more subordinate position. So the Liu family survives that challenge, that effort to be manipulated by the imperial in-laws. By this time, the 
descendants of the original military leaders who had been given land to control out in the eastern part of the empire, are starting to become a little restless. There are a number of efforts by the emperors to maintain and extend their control over the east, which are resisted by the local strongmen out there. This comes to a head in 154 BC, when a rebellion takes place. Several of the military rulers in the eastern part of the empire rise up and challenge the power of the Liu family. But not all of them. And the Liu family proves to be very adept at manipulating the strong men in the east against one another, so that some of the states are weakened. Some of the states or rulers are weakened and defeated. And then those territories are absorbed into the direct imperial administration and used as a base for further operations against the remaining strongmen in the east. Within a few years, all of eastern China is removed from, from the control of these military leaders and integrated into the imperial administration. This is really a critical development because it indicates that, for one thing, that the Chinese have learned a lesson from their history, from the history of the Zhou. They recognized the threat that independent power, or at least a semi-independent power in eastern China, represented, and were able to effectively counteract that when it began to become a serious problem. By mid-century, by about 150 BC, the Han Empire is a single administrative entity, no longer with this division between East and West. That sets the stage for the emergence of one of the greatest figures in imperial history, an emperor who comes to the throne in 141 BC and reigns until 87 BC. So it's a long period with a single ruler. This is a man that we know as Wu Di. Di is an abbreviation for Huangdi, the term for emperor that Qin Shi Huangdi was the first to implore. And Wu is simply the honorific title that he has. So this is what we call a, a temple name or a posthumous name. Emperor Wu, or Wu Di, presides over the Han Dynasty at the period where it really begins to mature. He carries through what we sometimes call the Han Synthesis. Han Synthesis creates and consolidates an imperial order, an administrative order, and also an ideological order, which remains the foundation for imperial politics for the next 2,000 years. The system that's put together in the second century BC, particularly under Wu Di, is modified. It evolves, it changes, it adapts to changing circumstances. But its essence, the core of the system, as it's forged at this time, remains pretty much stable for the remainder of imperial history. So what is the Han Synthesis? Well, it's a weaving together, a blending of three basic components. One, Confucianism, the political philosophy, focusing on human relationships, focusing on both hierarchy and reciprocity, focusing on the ideas, a properly ordered society, regulated and facilitated, by the use of ritual, based upon the moral self-cultivation of gentlemen, the gentlemen who learn, who study, who are educated in the teachings of Confucius. This is the way for a good society. This is the foundation for a well-ordered human community. Blended with this are elements of legalism, not legalism as a philosophy, not the philosophical explanation of legalism, but the practical operation of the state. The idea of a system of law, the idea for rewards and punishments, 
These are still carried on by the Han state, but they're mellowed, they're softened, and they're made more humane by being conjoined with the philosophy of Confucianism. Law, regulations, rewards, punishments, meted out, dealt out in a system which recognizes the centrality of human relationships. In a sense, it's the idea from Western discourse of justice tempered with mercy, of a system of law and order which also recognizes the humanity of all the people who are involved in it. Finally, a third element, along with Confucianism and legalism, is what we might think of as a more Taoist element, or perhaps a cosmological element, which is to say that Confucianism and legalism, Confucianism and practical administration, are very concerned with the day-to-day -day operations of the world, very concerned with the mundane social life that people lived in human communities. But there are larger systems. There's a larger world. There's the whole universe out there, a natural world, a world of unseen phenomena, spiritual dimensions to human life. And these need to be dealt with as well. The cosmological aspects of the Han synthesis seek to situate human society within this larger cosmic order. One particular manifestation of that is in the teachings, the ideas of a man called Dong Zhongxu. Dong Zhongxu teaches, he brings together a number of ideas that have been around in China for a long time. But he brings them together and synthesizes them and creates what's sometimes called a system of correlative cosmology, a system that seeks to explain correlations, connections between phenomena that can be observed in the natural world and actions taking place in human society. Basically, this is the doctrine of the interpretation of omens, the interpretation of signs. If there's an earthquake, if there's an eclipse or a meteor shower, if there's a flood or a drought, any sort of natural phenomenon may be interpreted as a sign that the natural order of things is disturbed in some way. It may be a portent, an omen of a coming event, or it may be an indication that something's wrong, that something isn't right in the world, in human society. Human misbehavior, and most importantly, this relates to behavior of the emperor. If the emperor is doing something wrong, not necessarily intentionally, but if the emperor is a bad guy, if he's doing something which he's not even aware isn't right, he needs to become aware of that. The interpretation of these omens is one way in which the imperial advisors can alert the emperor to some of the problems that may be out in society. This situates human social activity within a larger natural and cosmic quarter. These are the three dimensions of the Han synthesis. Confucian as a political philosophy, legalist administrative practice, and the cosmological embeddedness of human society. Wu Di also, in addition to this political cultural synthesis, provided, presided over a, a number of administrative initiatives. He was a very proactive emperor. He had a vision of the state as an instrument for doing good, a vision of the state which was consistent with his understanding of Confucianism as a mechanism for pursuing the good in society and in life. On the one hand, this may have been just a convenient rationale for his desire to expand his power. The period of Wudi's reign is a period of great military expansion. Chinese forces push into the northern part of Korea, and they push into the south, down into what's now Vietnam. They project Chinese power far out into Central Asia. Chinese force, Chinese political control, ex is extended over territories far beyond what had been encompassed in previous states. Even in the Shen, 
when it wasn't in its expansive phase. So Wudi creates the largest empire for the Chinese up until this time. Within the empire itself, he also has a very new kind of governing system in that he wants the government, he wants the state, to solve the problems for people, to get out there and to be directly engaged in social and particularly economic life. One way in which this is manifest is in the creation of government monopolies, certain critical commodities, things that everybody needed, like salt, iron for tools, alcohol, things that were produced not necessarily everywhere, not like grain, which can be grown just about everywhere, but commodities which were produced in certain places and then distributed through a marketing system. What Woody was against was the manipulation of the market by private interests to enrich themselves. In other words, he was against mercantile profiteering. He set up government monopolies where salt, iron, alcohol, a few other critical commodities were regulated by the state, where their production was controlled by the state, their distribution was controlled by the state, so that prices could be kept low enough that these things, which were needed by everybody, could be afforded by everybody. In this way, a stable order, some of the conditions of peace and prosperity which were desired under Confucian ideas, could be maintained with the active participation of the state. So the state becomes an agency for fostering and creating the good life. He also began some practices that evolved quite extensively in later times, but have their origins under Wudi, of developing new mechanisms for recruiting educated gentlemen into government service. In particular, he began the practice of holding examinations, having tests at court where individuals would come in and be given certain questions, write out their answers, and demonstrate their scholarship, demonstrate their wisdom, their education. If they were sufficiently qualified, if their answers, if their writing was considered to be sufficiently worthy, then they would be appointed to positions in government. It's not a major mechanism at this time for recruiting people into government service. People came into the service of the government during this period largely on the basis of what we might call recommendation. If they were known to be competent individuals, or if someone who was already a part of the government said, I know somebody, and they're a good candidate for this, then that individual would be brought in. It was still a relatively small circle of acquaintance at the top, and people were recruited largely on the basis of pre-existing relationships. But the search for more objective, more neutral means of recruitment, of testing the talent and merit of individuals, begins under Wu Di, and it's part of his sense of a government, which is morally of a high moral quality, morally pure, morally engaged by seeking out the best and the brightest to serve the interests of the community. Wudi dies in 87 BC, having presided over a long era of peace and expansion and prosperity. Having crafted his government and established this posture of activism and intervention, he then dies. And after his death, his policies are reviewed, or debated. In 81 BC, there's a great debate at court. And it's come down to us in written records. And it's known as the debate on salt and iron. And it's one of the great political rhetorical texts in Chinese history. Because in it, two sets of officials argue over whether it's a good thing for the state to intervene in the economy. One side argues that yes, 
It's the job of the state to regulate private greed and to ensure that the interests of the ordinary people are protected, that they're not subject to the exploitation of greedy merchants. The other side argues that the government shouldn't be doing this, that the government shouldn't be intervening in society, that the government should merely create a set of moral expectations. The government should itself be good, should itself act in a proper way, and by setting that example, people in private society, including merchants and others who engage in the buying and selling of goods, will themselves be inspired to behave properly. It's improper, they argued, for the government to enrich itself by involvement in economic activities. The government should instead content itself with taxation on grain and the land, and shouldn't get involved in other kinds of economic activity. These debates were quite significant at the time, and have been looked back on by later Chinese as setting out the parameters of how interventionalist, how activist government should be. In practice, what they decide is to abandon most of Wudi's monopolies, most of the economic monopolies that he had established, and to allow the economy and society to go their own way, with a very minimal level of government intervention from the top. The period after Wudi's death, down to about the turn of the millennium, beginning of the common era, the beginning of the present era, was one in which the Han Dynasty had certainly reached a very mature, very stable condition. But now we have a very not dramatic period, of a period where a succession of relatively minor emperors maintain the rule of the Liu family. During this time, the imperial court becomes a little more self-centered, becomes more concerned with its extravagant entertainment, its extravagant social life. Emperors are less and less directly engaged in the affairs of administration. The kind of activist emperor that Wu Di had been disappears, and we have instead emperors who leave the administration of affairs to their officials. They don't manage the state directly. This allows officials to become perhaps uh, a little corrupt, to line their pockets, to put their own interests ahead of those of the emperor or the government. And we get a period where corruption and indulgence becomes characteristic. The revenues of the states are ignored. The interests of day-to-day -day administration are neglected. And military affairs tend to be neglected as well. There are efforts again by in-law families, relatives by marriage of the imperial family, to manipulate the court. There are a lot of different problems. And these are brought to a head in the year 7 AD, when the emperor Zhang Di dies without an heir. There's a brief period that follows where power is usurped by a man named Wang Mang, who rules the country in his own name for about 20 years. But then he dies, and no one is there to succeed him, and a collateral line of the Liu family, another branch of the Liu family, reestablishes its rule. And we enter into a period that's known as the later Han. The first half of the dynasty is the former Han, the second half the later Han. That runs on for another 200 years. And we'll talk about the later Han in the next lecture. Thank you.